<risa> Son de hora y media. Es hora de... Okay, sí. ¿Igual aquí? Yeah. Ah, ¿qué te vas a estar ahora a mí? Sí, pero ¿quién va a terminar la hora. A ver, si, si hay preguntas, eso seguimos, pero a ver. Ah, sí, porque pues nadie tiene que hacer. En una, o sea, en una hora sí, pero sí, en 120 no. minutos nadie tiene nada que hacer. No. Así que te puedes explayar. Muchas gracias. Vamos. Y las estigmas. Estas. Okay. Y estás por Blackboard comunicado con Faustino que tiene COVID. Ok. No apago la luz. ¿Se apaga la luz o no? Hey guys, uh, welcome to the seminar, uh, special seminar today. Um, as you know, uh, uh, there can be three of these uh, special seminars, and the main goal of the seminar is to present um, success uh, uh, cases of um, people involved in um, uh, research. Having to do with uh, data science, applications of data science, uh, machine learning, and computing. This is uh, brought to you by Microsoft. It sounds like an announcement from the test commercial. And uh, the interesting part of the, of the talks, of the three talks, is that uh, all three speakers were uh, took, took this class here at UTEP. Uh, so the, uh, this, this guy was sitting where you are a few years ago, the same as Mario, the other guy that's going to come out uh, in September, I think, and uh, Andrea also, who is uh, on the computing at the uh, Old Bridge. And uh, so I asked uh, our speaker, Oscar Lopez, to give you um, a little bit of uh, his background so that you can see what it takes to become a uh, PhD in something and uh, become a researcher. And um, he's going to tell you a little bit just the flavor of uh, uh, what he does in terms of uh, research. And uh, it turns out that he's from um, he's working in Florida, Florida Atlantic University. And every time that he comes back to his hometown, El Paso, he gets allergies. And so he's not, he's not COVID. He was tested yesterday, uh, so that he's going to be coughing and sneezing if it is not COVID. And, and thanks for coming. Okay. Take it. Uh, yeah. Uh, thank you. And uh, nice to be back in Utah. It's been a while. Uh, and thanks to the organizers and to Microsoft, I guess. Okay, so yeah, my name is Oscar Lopez. Uh, the title of my talk is Multiple Data Analysis Applications to Marine Imaging. And um, right now I'm working as a research professor uh, in Florida Atlantic University. And in particular, I work in a Harbor Branch Oceanographic Institute. So yeah, as, as what I said, basically, what I'm going to talk about here is just um, my background, um, what I've studied and worked on so far to get to this point, and projects that I'm currently currently working on you know, in data science and mathematics. So this is how the rest of the talk is going to go. Uh, first, I'm going to talk about just my career, my background. Um, and then I, after that, um, I'm going to start talking about the projects that I'm currently working on. Uh, one is um, frugal hyperspectral imaging. And then the other one is like, it's more theoretical, theory of 
into analysis and tensor composition. So uh, uh, I'll kind of give you a, a you know a, a high view of, of all these topics, but uh, I can go into details of you know uh, offline or or anything later. Okay, so let's start with uh, my career. So the other guy here, um, I was actually I started here in 2007, graduated high school, uh, Eastern High School, and um, came to UCAT. That's me at the working at the ACES Academic Center for Engineers and Scientists. I don't think you guys have that anymore, do you? But it was, it's, it's at the entrance of the physical science building, the same. Yeah. So there was a couple of these little offices, and we were supposed to guide you to rooms, and also we would give tutoring and that kind of stuff. Um, so that would mean like, I don't know, I was 18 or something. And I actually came in as a chemistry major. I, I wanted to do math. Um, I wanted to be a mathematics major, but I had received a scholarship in, in chemistry from the American Chemical Society. And one of the conditions was that I have to be a chemistry major and I wanted the money. So I just, I just took a hit and was a chemistry major in the beginning. And then after that, um, I got another scholarship from NOAA. Uh, NOAA is the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration. And with that scholarship, I transferred to the University of Texas at Austin in 2009. And now I'm also a mathematics major. And um, in my undergrad years, I actually did a lot of internships. And um, I, think, I think this really shaped um, you know, my career, in particular because of the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration. Uh, because of them, I always remained in some way close to oceanographic or atmospheric science. And then a lot of these internships also pushed me that way further. And um, I learned a lot of things. So for example, this, this first one, the first one I did was at the University of Florida, the Gainesville, Florida. And that was in a worm tracking algorithm. So they would literally have a camera and a microscope, and we would try and track algorithms and see how they would behave in, with different reactants or chemicals. And I didn't know how to program before that. I, I have actually never taken a programming class. So when I did that internship, I, I just learned the hard way how to program and it just stuck. So you, you get a lot of valuable skills just doing these internships and just, you know, just diving into a deep end. And uh, I, did, I did an internship at UCLA. That was a ship detection using uh, periscope technology. And then at Princeton at the Geophysical Fluid Dynamics Laboratory, uh, Earth models that use um, uh, self gravitation, uh, basically. But um, all these internships really um, helped, I think, shape my career and I got to travel and have fun and meet people. So I really encourage you to apply for these types of opportunities. Okay, so after that, it was, um, you know, it was time to get a job or keep going to graduate school. So graduate school it is. Um, so I actually, I first went for a master's degree in mathematics. At, so I stayed at UT Austin and that's where I became uh, involved in signal processing. So that's like, how you acquire data and then how you process it to get information out of it and how you compress it and store it efficiently. Those types of algorithms, theory, that kind of thing. Um, I got interested in that in uh, UT Austin. So after that, I pursued my PhD in Canada at the University of British Columbia in mathematics. And it was pretty cool because in, in UBC, I was actually half mathematics and half in the Earth and Ocean Science Department. So I work a lot on what's called compressive sensing, which um, I'll get to. I'll get to what that is in a bit. So some Weber's problems. Basically, what that means is um, sometimes when you acquire data, you immediately have you know an image. You acquire the data and you have an image or you have the product, final product you want. But sometimes you get the data and you still have to process it, you know, in a certain way. And that's called solving a number inverse problem to get the image or whatever it is you want out of the data. So I'm kind of interested in input problems, and those are very important in seismic data uh, acquisition and imagery. And that's what I mainly worked on in the Earth and Ocean Science Department. I worked on seismic data acquisition, which is basically, yeah, it's just how you go about placing sensors, sources, and receivers um, in the ocean, for example, or, or on land to find where that, you know, that very important uh, gold, gold uh, oil is. Uh, so there was a lot of cool projects that I was involved in. Um, in particular, I worked with the Scientific Laboratory for Imaging and Modeling. Um, and it was basically, it was basically just, how do you go about placing sensors? So how do you go about placing sources and receivers? And how do you minimize the amount of sources and receivers that you need to acquire the data that is typically required by these applications? Um, and 
that has to do with composite sensing. I'll get more into that in a little bit. And I also worked a lot with uh, Mitsubishi and Frank Research Laboratory in Cambridge. So, um, and, and this was mainly like um, image processing type of applications. So this gave, this gave me a really good uh, taste of like when working in the industry would be like, which was really cool, but I did decide I prefer to go for bracket uh, a professor position or maybe in a national lab. Um, okay, so it's graduation time. Uh, I did my, so I had to do my thesis and my thesis was basically um, named Embracing Nonlinear Phone Samples. And it's just one of the benefits of having non-uniform, uh, non-periodically placed sensors to acquire the data. So it's just like, it's, it's, it's basically what it looks like in this image. Typically, what people try and do, people try and acquire data periodically. So each of these samples, you're sampling some one dimensional function, two, three, four dimensional function. And I mean, people like things simple. So you place the sensors, these red dots in a periodic every space uh, manner. So the, the spacing between each of these red dots is the same. But now in practice, that's sometimes impossible to do like this technology. You place sensors at the bottom of the ocean, but it's impossible to place them exactly where you want it. And there's currents that move them. So if you end up more with a situation like what's on the left, you get these two sensors that are kind of deviated from where you wish they were. The funny thing is, it's actually been known since like the 50s or 60s that there are benefits. Instead of doing this kind of periodic sampling, which, uh, which the theory is very well known and developed in that area, physical processing, there's actually a lot of benefits that you can get if you do non-uniform sampling. For example, um, relative to the amount of samples you need, periodic samples, you can actually, with less samples, still acquire the same signal you want. So that's less samples, that's less time you have to spend on the field acquiring data, and that's less data you have to store. You have to actually, you know, store them on a hard drive. And this actually, um, this is like actually used by Pixar. Like Pixar were, were the ones that engage brought this phenomenon to light to the world. And they use this for what's called MAA2. So basically, a mixing is um, it's artifacts and images that are at, at the very least are not pleasing to the human eye. So for example, here, uh, especially at the very top, where you have very high frequency material, you know, very, very um, dense material, you see these kind of um, weird noise, which are called jaggies. So you get this kind of weird noise that you don't you want to get rid of, and you get something that's more pleasing to the human eye. And it's just out that if you do um, if you produce images, which what they do is called ray tracing, if, if you know a little bit about computer graphics. If you do ray tracing in a non-uniform kind of random manner, you can get an image more like what's on the right, which is, I mean, at the very least, it's more pleasing to the human eye, right? And so this is a pretty cool phenomenon, but there's not, there wasn't a lot of theory uh, about this and how to use it. And that was the main contribution of my thesis, is um, studying this problem theoretically and its applications to seismology. And um, the contribution was, I was able to provide some insights as to how you can achieve this and why, why it works. A uh, question? Yes. So how did you determine the non-uniform? Like, how was it distributed? Yeah. Was it a random sampling? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, um, so the question was, how did you distribute the non-uniform sampling? And what works best, and also in theory, what you can prove best is non-uniform sampling. So, I mean, sorry, is random sampling. So it's not deterministic. It's not something you get to choose. It's, not, it's, it's just um, randomly sampled in some manner. Either you purposely make it random or the system itself um, randomly deviates them. But that's actually a, that's actually a, very, a very weird uh, question because it turns out that if you do not uniform sampling, but you get to choose where the samples are, it turns out that um, you, can't, you can't prove these types of results. So it's kind of weird, right? If you choose the non-uniform sampling, you can, you can always show that it's not gonna work for some type of signals. But if you do it in a random manner, then it'll work with high, with high probability. It, there's a very high probability that these methods will work. So it's actually kind of a weird philosophical question, but um, you know, we'll be here all day and we we'll dive into that. But to answer your question, random sampling. Okay, um, so that was my thesis. And then, like I said, I decided to go for a more academic position. So after that, I went to uh, my postdoc, uh, which is typically what's required uh, between graduating from your PhD to going to a professor position, a postdoctoral position. And I decided to try a national lab. So I went to San Diego National Laboratories in Albuquerque, 
ABQ in Mexico. And um, there I mainly work on multi-way data analysis. So now, so far, um, everything I talked about is more like one dimensional signals, maybe two dimensional signals. Things get even weirder when it's multi-dimensional signals, which means three dimensions, four dimensions or, or higher. So for example, here, this is a three dimensional cube. It has three axes, right? And basically, how do you efficiently process this kind of data? And in particular, what I study, and this will keep throughout the whole talk, this will keep reappearing over and over. It's called the canon canonical polyadic decomposition, CP decomposition. And I mean, the idea is simple, it's just, it's what humans always do. You know, um, how, do you eat, how do you eat an elephant, you know, one bite at a time? I mean, I don't know why you would want to eat that elephant, but um, that's what they say. So basically, it's what humans always do is, how do you handle a very complex, large, large data set? You break it up into much simpler little pieces that you can understand better. And that's what the idea is here. Get, um, get a high-dimensional object and then use this decomposition, TP decomposition, to break it up into these very simple components, which are called rank one components. So maybe some of you, hopefully some of you have taken um, linear algebra, learned about the rank, of, the rank of a matrix. Basically the same thing in the matrix. You want to decompose a matrix as the outer product of, of two vectors. Um, in the three-dimensional case, four-dimensional case, you try to, you know, generalize that and you express as a sum of, of the outer product of the dimension number of vectors. So three-dimensional case, each of these is, is the outer product of three vectors and you try to write it as, so as few components as possible. So this would be uh, R components. So that would be a right R representation of the data. So it really is just generalizing linear algebra to higher dimensions. Now, the weird thing is just, yeah. Is it possible for example? It's important. It's impossible to Right, yeah. So let's say you have a, you have a each time instance. So the question was, is, is it possible to do a temporal type of, um, type of data set? Type of, so yeah, imagine um, you have, at every time instance, you have an image, right? So that's a, that's a matrix, it's actually that's a cube. Because that would be, if you have red, green, and blue channels, that would be a cube. So let's say at every, every second you're taking images, every second you have a matrix. And then the time axis would be the third axis. So you would have a sequence of matrices. You could consider that a three-dimensional image. And there are benefits to treating, treating them as a three-dimensional object rather than looking at each image separately. And that's kind of the, that's kind of the motivation for this whole research is if you process the whole, if you're not afraid of high dimensions, you can get a lot of benefits if you process data, data this way. Okay, so this will keep, um, this, will keep this will keep coming up, but um, that's all it is. It's just generalizing linear algebra. And the weird thing is that linear algebra, everything is very well understood. You guys take courses and these courses have been taught for decades, you know? But as soon as you get to three dimensions, all that theory goes out the window, and um, there's actually no equivalent of linear algebra in higher dimensions. It gets it gets kind of tricky. So that's kind of a challenge here. Is um, not only the applications of this type of decomposition, but also the theory. That's something that I work on. Okay, I'll get to that a little bit later. And then finally, uh, my current position. Well, no. Yeah. Before you go, know it. Uh... You were given the chance of choosing between Sandia National Lab and MIT. Why did you choose to go to Sandia instead of MIT? Um, so yeah, I was um, I, I, when I was applying for postdoc positions, I got a position at at MIT. Um, I forgot the name of the lab, but um, anyways, extremely famous lab. In, in, uh, um, yeah, but um, honestly, the reason I chose, for, first, I wanted to, um, I did want to try what it was like working at an international lab. And the other thing is, um, the, um, I guess I would say that the person I, I interviewed with, the person that would have been my, my advisor, was kind of a very, um, a very intense, very high pressure person. And I don't know about you guys, but I really prioritize, um, you know, having a relaxed life, doing what I like and having the freedom to do the research that I want to do. At MIT, I mean, it's kind of a more prestigious place, but 
I, I really felt I would have lost that flexibility to do to do the research that I wanted to do. And, and then also another thing was also um, over there it was more about the applications. It wasn't so much about the theory, and I wanted to focus more on theoretical work. I mean, also applications and and computational aspect, aspects, but. Over there, it was mainly just computational and uh, applications, not too much theory. So I thought this was a better fit for me uh, for those reasons. Yeah. And how about housing? How does it compare in Albuquerque with respect to Boston? Yeah, um, that's one thing I'm going to say about uh, postdoctoral position. I mean, national labs, they pay you really well for a postdoc. So um, postdoc position here, I was getting 85,000. Postdoc position at MIT would have been more like 6,000. Um, six five thousand, and then on top of that, Boston is not it's not too cheap to to live in Boston. I would have to live like on on the outskirts basically, and in, in some of national labs, I live uh, yeah I live fairly close, like a ten minute drive, and um, and you know also closer to home. You know you want to be close to your family, and it was a four hour drive from El Paso, so that also that also had a, a decision for me. Um, Okay, so now, and then finally, uh, my current position. An assistant research professor position at Harbor Branch Oceanographic Institute, and that's in Florida Atlantic University. So here's like a, here's like a map of, uh, like a flyer from Florida Atlantic University. So this is a very well known shape of Florida. Uh, we're all on the, on the East Coast, um, on the Atlantic. So in Boca Raton, that's where the main campus is. And we have, there's several satellites, but this is Harbor Branch, where way up north, um, kind of completely on our own, which I like it. We're like, we're like on the beach, and the campus is really nice. So this is a campus here. Um, we're right on the, on the lagoon. So all Florida, I, I don't know if you've got Florida, but all Florida, there's a big island separating open ocean from brackish water, which is the, the, the lagoon. In this case, it's the Indian River Lagoon. Which um, we do a lot of um, a lot of research on the Indian River Lagoon, and we're right on. The, we have open access to the Indian River Lagoon. Uh, my office is well, my office is right here, uh, also the, the lagoon, and uh, there's always manatees in here. There's two crocodiles on this pond over here, and um, like they all have names. Like everyone there, most people there are um, marine biologists, so you know they love animals and protect all the crocodiles and uh, manatees. And dolphins also come in once in a while. But yeah, it's, I, I really love the campus and it's, uh, it's really cool. So I just started actually this year my professor, uh, position. And, um, and yeah, in the end, I decided for a research professor position. The main difference between a research professor and a standard uh, professor position or tenure track is that, um, so tenure track, basically um, you have to teach courses. So it's half, half teaching half research and then after a certain number of years you get like a like a tenure position which means they can't fire you you can basically do whatever you want and you won't get fired so you have like a you have an uh that added, added layer, layer of, of security research professor position it's all you do is research you can have students if you want you can teach courses if you want but you don't have to your main priority is research but the trade-off is you don't have that tenure track position you don't have that security and also, there's much more pressure to bring in money because, you know, to do research, money isn't free. Like, it doesn't come out of nowhere. You have to find sponsors that will sponsor your research and give you the money to hire students to buy equipment and so on. So that's a, the that's a kind of trade-off, but I, it's more my style to just focus on research. But I do have students um, research that, that do research, and I am going to teach a semester. I mean, sorry, I am going to teach a course next semester. Um, so I do like teaching. I do like having students, but... Um, I prefer this type of position. And the research, uh, there's a lot of research going on at HPOI, Harbor Branch. The main research topics that I do are hyperspectral imaging, which I'm going to get into in a little bit, bioluminescent signal detection, um, which I won't discuss as much, but I'll talk about a little bit, um, LIDAR underwater imaging. So, this, the same kind of technology that, does, that they use for self driving cars, right, that does um, uh, distance and ranging. Um, the same thing underwater, but underwater is trickier because you have turbulence and you have different, um, more adversarial conditions, light conditions. So it, it gets a bit trickier underwater to do, you know, UAVs, uh, unmanned, I mean, underwater um, uh, vehicles. 
And then I also work on more theoretical uh, the theory of tensor decomposition and the applications to oceanography. So that's one thing that I like about here, even though it's mainly oceanography, they did accommodate me and let me work on more on my more theoretical, you know, things. And yeah, so far, so far I really like the position. Okay, so now let's get to some of the research. Okay, so now I'm gonna talk about um, hyperspectral imaging. And then I'll also talk about like uh, the theory of tension compositions. So um, frugal hyperspectral imaging, and you'll see right now when I call it frugal, frugal means like economic, economic uh, hyperspectral imaging. So first, um, just like a little bit of background, this is actually a really big project. There's like um, four professors, four of us involved in this project. It's funded by two grants from the ONR, the Office of Naval Research. And it's actually a huge project. It's like $12 million in budget. And we have a lot of people working on this. There's, there's a lot of different components. I'm mainly working on the computational imaging um, side of the project, but there's a lot of mechanical, electrical engineering, atmospheric science, and marine biology people involved in this. But the two projects are basically um, two sets. Um, using miniature satellites, so um, mean satellites to, to do some, some kind of sensing of the Earth. And the second part is bioluminescence imaging, which is, I don't know if you guys have seen bioluminescence, but um, it's these, uh, these bacteria that glow when, when agitated. And it's actually not known, it's not really understood why they, why they glow um, exactly. But typically, the, the most typical one is called bioflagets, and we're lucky enough that in the Indian River Lagoon, we have a lot of um, bioluminescence activity. I just did a, I did like a clear, I just did a tour of, of a kayak tour of bioluminescence at midnight, and it's like a clear kayak. So you're going through it, and it's like it's just reacting to the kayak, putting through the water. It's really amazing, and um, we've gone several times to collect data in the Indian River Lagoon with, with certain cameras um, and high spectral cameras, which I'll get to in a bit. But um, that kind of sucks because like we have to go like at night, we have to go like at 10, 11, and it's just no matter how no matter how much bug spray you use, no matter what kind of bug spray you use, you're just gonna get bit and eaten. And but anyways, it's really fun to go out and, and uh and leave all these objects and collect data. Are there any open trials there? Yeah, yeah, there's there, there's a lot of alligators actually out there. Yeah, there's a lot of alligators. What, what is the size of the satellite? So I'll get to that in a bit. Um but uh these are typically, the one we're building is like 20 centimeters by 20 centimeters by 30, 34 centimeters. So it's quite a, a miniature satellite. And that's mainly what I'm gonna focus on. I'm only gonna focus on, on the miniature satellite, but we're using that also to do bioluminescence uh, uh, imaging. Okay, so, um, right, okay. So now let's get to hyperspectral. What, what is a hyperspectral image? So in comparison to a standard camera, like, Typical images that you have on your phone or off the shelf cameras um, that, that, that you buy um, at Best Buy or whatever only have three color channels red, green, and blue. With these, you should typically these three frequencies. So you can decompose an image, you can picture, and you decompose it into your blue, green, and red channels. So you have only three channels. And that's, well, you know, for, for certain purposes, for, for us looking at our pictures, that's good enough. But um, there's a lot of uh, spectral information, a lot of different um, colors that that, um, that can be used for other purposes. And that's what a hyperspectral image is. We also record information from other wavelengths of light. So other colors, basically. And what makes just the difference is that a hyperspectral camera has dozens or even hundreds of channels. So now we decompose the image into many, many channels. And now you have a range of frequencies. So, uh, typically, um, what you'll see being used for wavelength is lambda, it is uh, this, this symbol here, lambda. And it depends on, on the application and what you're working on. But um, for us, typically, we go between 400 nanometers and 700 nanometers. So well within the human visual range, but we also push the near infrared and the ultra ultraviolet. Yeah. What are some applications? Right. So the question was, what are some applications of um, hyperspectral imaging? And um, that was actually the next slide. So uh, basically what it can be used for, um, and what we care about the most is like remote sensing. So we want to, we have an aerial view of a scene. 
like let's say if you're recording a compass in the river and you have a high spectral sensor, and basically what you can use it is for detecting different materials in the scene. So just like just like your fingerprints, right? Your fingerprints are very complex and they can be used to identify you uniquely, right? Same thing with uh, hyperspectral signatures. The more bands you have, the more unique signature you have. And from that, you can derive what each signature belongs to. So for example, here, um, you, you're recording different pixels. And in a certain pixel, you get spectral information. And you can just plug in that spectral signature. You can tell, oh, that looks like it's soil or some kind of rock. You know, you can get very specific, by the way. You can get extremely specific. Or if it's in the water, you can tell that it's water. And like I said, you can tell that it's a, a salinity level of the water. Or, and that's actually what um, my collaborators care about the most. Is we want this technology to monitor salinity levels close to the, the Amazon region. So that's what we make they care about the most. Or vegetation. You know? So that's how you can use hyperspectral data. You can, uh, you can recognize what materials are in the scene of interest. And, but however, this doesn't come for free. Now, uh, as you can imagine, you have a drastic increase in the amount of data. So now we got used to, like RGB cameras, we got used to these megapixel cameras, right? Like thousands of, by thousands size image, right? And typically when you have only RGB, that's three channels. It's not a lot of data. They, they, they can get pretty, you know, you can still have a lot of data, we have a lot of very high quality images. And now in this case, you're really hitting a bottleneck. Now. You have you still want that same resolution of commercial cameras, but now you have hundreds of wavelengths, and now it gets very hard to store this data and transmit it. So in some situations you're okay, like right? here, if you're in a helicopter, you can just have a you know, just have a computer on the helicopter with terabytes of memory, and you can just store it. But there are other situations where you just can't store all that data. And that's one situation that that's a situation that we care about is um spaceborne or satellites hyperspectral images. Um, so th there's already um, satellite hyperspectral imagers. Um, one very famous one is the, the HICO, the HICO mission um, by NASA and the ONR. HICO means hyperspectral imager for the coastal oceans. And it was launched, it was launched in 2009 and it was put on the ISS, the International Space Station. It was put on, on, on the Japanese module. I actually don't even know here in the image exactly where it is, but um, it's you know it's it's kind of bulky. They have to launch it and then it has to be operated and maintained by the Japanese center. Um, so you know it's kind of it's it's a really important tool, but it's kind of expensive and and a complex project. So our goal is to take this to the next level and demonstrate that the same capabilities are possible with much cheaper with much smaller satellites. And this is one thing that that's becoming popular right now. Um, I don't know if you guys have heard about CubeSat, but it's just these miniature satellites. Um, and this is about the size that they are, but they can be bigger because um, they're modular, which means um, you can you, you, you can take a couple of these chassis and put them together and make a bigger satellite. So they range as small as 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters, and they can range, range to, you know, uh, maybe one meter, one meter by one meter by one meter. But ours is going to be aiming for like 20 by 20 by 34 centimeters, which is about, I think it's about the size. Go back to the previous slide. I'm curious about the, how you understand the composition of this just by the wavelengths. Like if it says soil rock, I guess it meant to be a whole bunch of different proportions, right? right? And, and that the wavelength doesn't, or maybe it does tell you the proportions. So is there like some ML you're applying to kind of pull apart the, the different materials? Yeah, exactly. So there's a couple of things you need to know. So, I mean, you need to understand the, the spectra of what you're after. So, um, you need to already know what the, for example, if you're looking in particular for um, aspen trees, then you need to know, understand very well what that signature is going to look like, you know, on your, on your sensor, first of all. And then after that, um, it gets more complicated because like you said, you have some kind of a mixing. You may have more than one material in a pixel, right? Because um, you're very high up. Each of these pixels are about uh, meters apart. So in that, in that, in that large region, you can have several materials combined. So there you need a model that tells you how these materials combine to form the, that special signature. So you're right, you might have to do more. You might have to get purely a signature for water. You might get water with algae, for example, right? And then you need to know how to, how to decompose, how to, 
how to unmix. It's called, it's called spectral unmixing, actually. And there's many ways to do it. How to unmix the part that you want from, from the other part. And that tells you, you know, that tells you how much of, of uh, how much of the material after, um, you know, is in that pixel. Uh, how much is composed of, let's say, water or versus algae. And I'll talk, to, I'll, talk to, I'll, I'll talk about that very little right now in a bit. Um, but yeah, the typical one is called the linear mixing model. That's a very typical uh, mixture model for spectral signals mixing into a single pixel or a single measurement, let's say. But yeah, it's, it's not trivial how to do it. And, uh, you know, you have to make assumptions and have models for these types of, types of things. Yeah. Okay, so now, so yeah, we want to demonstrate the same kind of imaging capabilities with a miniature sensor. Um, but I mean, that has several challenges now. Um, so the benefits are we're going to reduce the cost of launching a satellite. The one, the hype one, cost like I think it was like eighty million dollars or something like that. And ours, ours, I mean, at the moment we have a two million dollar budget, but after we develop it, 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 it should be like half a million dollars to or less to develop these guys, and then we're going to launch only one to test that outfit. In the end, you can have like a whole army, a whole swarm of miniature satellites that can give you even better imaging than, and less complex imaging than, um, you know, standard, very large scale um, satellites. Okay, but our main, one of the main challenges is this here in red. Now you have to reduce the amount of data collected because now you don't have the luxury like in the high commission, so having a, 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 a computer and large memory on board now you have very limited space, so you have to minimize the amount of data you acquire. And not only that, but um, as the satellite is orbiting, you can have a very small window to transmit the data to a ground station. So you have to minimize the amount of data that you, that you transmit to the ground station. So you want to go from gigabytes, terabytes of data to, you know, megabytes of data is the goal. And then, of course, you want to do this in a good way. You have to, you know, you can't sacrifice um, the, the quality of the signal. You have to be able to reduce different types of noise that you will, you would encounter. So that's kind of the goal. And I guess let's see how I'm doing on time here. Okay. So now I'm going to go into more details, but I'm going to go a little bit faster now. So I think um, I will spend too much time otherwise. Okay. So now, um, so that's what I'm going to focus on. Like I said, there's a lot of different components. There's mechanical engineers working on this. There's electrical engineers working on this. And then my job is this part. My, my job is more of the image processing and data collection. How do you reduce the amount of data that you need? So that, that's what I'm going to focus on here. So, yeah. What kind of noise when you interfere with that? Right. So there's a lot of um, atmospheric distortion, for example. So if, if you're if you're recording like in this situation, like just a helicopter. You don't have a lot of you know space between the, the target and the sensor, but we're talking about you know out of space, so we have atmospheric distortion, and then the sensors themselves can kind of fail and give you false read noise, what's called um, shot noise or poisson noise, and then um, and then on top of that you can have like um, like environmental type of noise, like um, for example like, there can be like glare. From different lights that you don't really want there, for example, or let's say there's some kind of ship around the area, you know, that can produce noise or false signals that, that you don't really want to, you're not really interested. So that's that's a kind of uh, that's kind of noise that you might encounter. Okay, so now how do we reduce the amount of data? This is where um, compressive, what's called compressive sensing uh, comes in, and the idea is quite simple. So. Okay, here, let's focus on the one on red. The, um, the flow in red is what's typically the, st the standard way so far, the standard way of acquiring data. So typically, okay, so you have a, a survey region of interest, and then you have acquired dense data, which means for every pixel, for every pixel, for every frequency, wave band, you collect data. So now you acquire a lot of data, and then you compress it. Now, after that, you, in, in the computer, you find a way to compress, compress it typically using um, Fourier transform. I don't know if you guys have taken some harmonic analysis, but Fourier transforms, wavelength decompositions, these types of um, imaging technologies that really um, took place in the 90s with uh, MP3 and JPEG and all types of different image storing um, 
uh, algorithms. So after that, you store the data. But if you think about it, this is very wasteful time. You spend a lot of time acquiring all this data for every pixel, for every weight, right? Like, and then you throw most of it away because this is not for free. If you want to compress data, you do lose information. But the idea is that you keep the most, you keep important information and you lose not so important information. So every time you, you know, every time you open a song on Spotify or whatever, it's using decompression algorithms, but it's not the full quality of the original song as it was recorded in the studio. You know, same thing here. And that's kind of wasteful if you think about it. Like, why would you acquire all this data and then throw most of it away? And that's the goal of compressed sensing. You want to bypass this wasteful step in the middle. You want to go directly from collecting data to getting it, to like acquiring the data in a compressed format. So you skip this um, wasteful step. So that is less data that you have to collect and, and store and, in our case, transmit to the ground station. And then also, um, and then also, and then also, um, okay. Um, okay, so, so that's the goal. Now, this doesn't come for free, but the trade-off is now, uh, basically, you collect all of the data in compressed format, but now you don't, like, in typical workflow, when you compress it, you already kind of have the image. In our case, it's kind of tricky for you to achieve this, and you don't immediately have the image. You have to reconstruct, what's called reconstruct. So numerically, you have to have an algorithm that can reconstruct the image. So that's the trade-off. It's, um, it's less data you have to acquire. Oh yeah, I remember, I remember what I was gonna say. Less time acquiring the data, which is important. In some situations, um, the more time you're in the field taking samples, acquiring data, that's money and time that you're wasting. If you do it this way, that's less time that you have to collect data as well. So it's also economical in that sense. So the trade-off is now you have to do more processing. So you have to spend more time in a computer processing the data. But that's a good trade-off because I mean, you know, you go out in the field, you collect data, versus you're you know, you're comfortable in your office just letting the computer run, process, processing the images, right? So it's a pretty good trade-off. And also it doesn't come for free. There are some requirements. It doesn't work. This type of methodology doesn't work in general. There's two requisites. First of all, the data has to be in some sense low dimensional, which by the way, that's also a requisite for standard type of compression. So in other words, um, the data in some sense is less complicated than what it seems. There's a way, there's the information you're after is actually much less than the, than the entire amount of information or free variables that are there in case you're taking linear algebra, which I'll get to in a bit. So that's one thing, you have, you have low dimensional data, let's say simple data. The other thing is you need, the type of sampling is, I'm gonna call it non-conventional type of sampling. You need, you need to do some weird things to collect the data and I'll get to that in a bit too. So let's talk about these two things, low dimensional data, what does that mean? And the non-conventional sampling. Okay, so first, low dimensional data. Okay, why is hyperspectral data low dimensional? Um, it's not always low dimensional, but for most images that people are interested in, it is low dimensional. And the reason is here, um, the amount of spectral signatures are limited. So this is um, uh, data from, from the high commission that I just talked about, the high commissions. And if you look at the spectrum from, so we have uh, two pixels from the from land. So these are all, this is on the land. And these are pixels on the ocean. And even though these are kilometers apart, look at the, spe at the spectral signatures, right? They're pretty much exactly the same. So even though you have a lot of pixels and a lot of different wavelengths, the spectral signatures are actually very, very similar. So this is some kind of redundancy um, in the data. It's, it's not as much data as it seems. So um, this is what we're going to exploit, this, this redundancy. Now, how do we exploit it? And this is what I talked about before. We use these tensor multidimensional decomposition. Because now, if you think about it, I mean, we have a three dimensional cube. We have two axes for a spatial axis. We have an x spatial, y spatial axis, and then the third axis is the spectral axis. So we have a three dimensional data set. And now, and we decompose it um, this way as a, as a sum of few simple components. We should be able to really compress it. And just, to, just so you get an idea of how much compression you can have. So, Let's say this uh, cube has, let's say it's a perfect cube, right? And it has i pixels in the x and, and the 
I fix the each direction, so x, y, and spectral dimensions that have i pixels. So in i by i times i times i cubed, the number of free variables you would normally have for such an array is i cubed, i times i times i. So that's a lot of information you have to store. But if you're able to decom uh, decompose it this way with whatever the rank, whatever this rank r is, then you would reduce it to three times i times r, which you can just count, right? Each of these, each of these vectors size of i, you have three of them, and then you have r components, so three times i times r. And if the rank, if this rank the r is small, you have a very huge compression rate. Compression rate. So um, that's kind of the idea of how we're gonna exploit and compress the data. And like I said, this, this I can't claim this will work in general. You can always come up with a data set, like a very weird data set that won't that won't allow for, for efficient compression. But most images that people are after, like I, I've always seen this be the case. The rank is smaller than even one of the dimensions. So you go from you go from i cube to about i squared. So you reduce it by an order, by a very large order. Okay? And so yeah, this works really um, really well. Um, so like I said, the rank in the statistical position is relatively small because of the spectral redundancy. And this is um this is related to your question. Um, this, this actually fits very nicely with what's called the linear, the linear mixing model. And all the linear mixing model is, it's a very common model that scientists use to model. If you have two material in a scene, like, like right here, you have the table and the ground, but you collect spectral information from both of them, how do, how do these materials combine spectrally in the signature? And the most common uh, model for that is the linear mixing model. And this, this implementation actually fits that model perfectly. Um, because um, in that model, uh, you have our factor C. So these vectors C running, running in spectral dimension, they're actually going to directly give you spectral information of, of C. And these factors A and B running in the X and Y directions are going to give you the, the spatial information, which are called abundance. These are called n member information, spectral signature information, and, and um, abundance is the spatial information. So actually, this fits perfectly into typical models people use for hyperspectral imaging. So another benefit is, as soon as you acquire the data this way, you already have a good understanding of what spectral information is going to be in the scene. I mean, you still have to do some processing, some analysis, right? But you have you already have some level of understanding. And finally, you have very very efficient uh, algorithms to process this data. Instead of processing uh, processing IQ uh, variables, you only have to process you know, uh, this, this many, uh, three times I think R variables. So much more efficient data processing as well. So there's like a lot of benefits of compressing it this way. Okay, that's the low dimensional. I mentioned two things, right? I mentioned the requisites. I mentioned the low dimensional data structure and I mentioned the non-conventional sampling. So now um, we already have satisfied this with the low dimensional data. Now let's talk about the non-conventional sampling. So in our case, what we're going to do is what's called um, basically you encode, you, you scramble, encode your measurements. So we're going to encode the spectrum. So typically, um, and the key hardware here is this thing here, which is called it's a micro mirror device, which is it's your DLP, digital light processing. So this is a very, very cheap, very common hardware. You'll find it in any uh, digital television nowadays. It's, it's the way on. Um, Colors are, are projected into each pixel on the screen. So it's a very common hardware device which consists of millions of micro mirrors, like tiny, tiny mirrors, which you can have in the on position or the off position. So these are mirrors that you can kind of flip on, on and off at very, very high rates. Um, I mean, so such fast rates that when you're watching TV, you don't even notice when, you know, when the colors change, when the pixels change. And, and that's how they project the colors onto the screen. And now what we're going to do is as the light comes in uh, through, through a projection lens, right? So white light, hit, so when light hits the target, it comes in through, through our, our lens, and then hits a diffraction gradient. What the diffraction gradient does is it'll spatially split the, the light coming in into all its spectral components, you know, all the colors of the rainbow. It'll split it into all these colors, and then it'll focus it onto the digital micro mirror device. Now, typically, so typically when you acquire this data, you acquire one wavelength at a time. Now what we're going to do is 
we program the mirrors in a way that we can combine them, com combine different colors at the same time. So, for example, right now only this green mirror is on the up position, all the other mirrors are on the up position. So, we're not recording all these other wavelengths, we're only recording the green, the green wavelength. So what we're going to do is we're going to turn on multiple of these patterns, and that will give you a, a linear combination of, of the light. So, we're going to linear combine it into, into these kind of scrambled measurements. And, and that's going to help us reduce the amount of samples. Yeah. So here's a here's an illustration I made. Um, so I don't think I'll be getting a job at Pixar anytime soon, but I think it's pretty cool. So in this case, um, so I mean, we, we want to sound like technology, but um, the, the prototype we're going to have it on what's called a, a helicite. It's like a speaking balloon, and we have sensors mounted on the heel, and this is uh, hovering above some region of interest. So sunlight comes. Hits, but let's say the, the water, the lagoon water is reflected and is re directed into the sensor mounted on the heel. And now we're going to see what it looks like inside of the sensor. So inside of the sensor, there's a slit, you'll see right now better. So incoming sunlight focus, the slit focuses the incoming sunlight to the touch screen, splits it into spectral components onto the micro mirror device. So all the mirrors are at the off position, getting pointed to a light, light bulb, nothing is being recorded. But as you start turning on, uh, one uh, mirrors you do redirect them to a CCD array, uh, which which records um, reports the electrical charge and gives you spectral information. And now, as you can see, if you start turning on multiple mirrors at the same time, you combine those different wavelengths and so on. You can program whatever pattern of mirror that you want. You can program different patterns and get different combinations of light uh, recording. Okay, so this is a type of this is the type of sensing, the type of uh, sampling that's been proven to work to really reduce the, um, the amount of data you collect. And again, related to your question, how do you choose the mirrors? Theoretically, the best way that has been proven is just do it you know, random. Just just choose uniformly at random which um, mirrors are in the on and off position. But um, you can also pick yourself which how you want to program the mirrors, and we have research also into how you actually program these mirrors to best acquire the data that you're after. Okay, so here's a kind of like the final product of how everything's going to work for us. We have a miniature satellite going over a region of interest over here, and we have what's called push group, push group type imaging, which is um, basically what it means is we acquire a single line at a time and we sweep to the region. So that's why it's called push group. We switch it to the region, acquiring line by line by line. The light comes in from that line, type of grading, gets uh, decomposed into spectral components. We have the micro mirror device in which we program with different patterns. Those patterns combine the lights into very few encoded measurements. And now we have very few measurements that we have to transmit to a ground station. So the satellite has to be very few measurements. Uh, hopefully, you can reduce it by a lot. We transmit that to a ground station, and then in the ground station, we have to do the, the image deconstruction. So we don't have the image yet. We have to do some processing to get it. Um, and we're going to use this type of tensor decomposition algorithm. And finally, we get a final product. We get the hyperspectral image. So. And there's kind of a, um, actually, we can do more than this. Like, I mean, we're not just going to, we're not just going to launch a satellite, use it one time, and then, okay, buy satellite, trash. No, like the satellite's going to keep going around the Earth, right? And I think ours is going to go every 90, 90 minutes around the region that we're interested in. So as it keeps circling, we can, we can uh, improve, our, you know, we can improve our, our imaging much better. So the idea we have um, is now, once you have knowledge of the data, what it looks like, you can actually use that to update the patterns. So the transmission goes both ways. The satellite has to communicate with us, sends the data required, but we can also send it data and we get some data of how to reprogram the, the patterns on the microwave device. And we can do it in a way, once we have data, we understand it, we can do it in a way that more efficiently collects the data. So that's kind of, um, that's kind of the, the flow of how this works. And um, I'm going to skip this slide, but basically this is just how we go about reconstructing the data. And so here's the final product. Um, so in the end, uh, we, we, our goal is, and we, and we have done this quite easily, I do think it's better. The amount, okay, the amount of data, first, the amount of data we, 
um, transmits. How much is that reduced? So the amount of data collected and transmitted is reduced by a factor of 15. So that's 15 times less data that you have to collect and transmit from the satellite to the ground station. And I think we can do much better, actually. Um, but that was so far our goal in the, in the proposal, and so far we've met that goal. The second thing, now, once you, once you have your image, right? Once you have your image and you have it in this format, and you have it in this sensor format, once you have that, we can get very high compression rates. So after that, when we have in this CPT composition method, we can sort it with 1% of the, of the amount of data required by conventional compression. So, so um, in other words, conventional way that most spectral data is compressed will, will require, for us, for the resolution we require about 740 megabytes, and we only require four megabytes. So that's how little data we need to, you know, to store a hyperspectral image. And that's comparing it to, you know, compressed data, not comparing it to the raw data. The raw data is in, in the gigs. In, in, uh, it's, it's like it's multiple gigs. So we do a much better job than the standard compression algorithms. That we kind of, uh, we're kind of hoping that this will become the new standard for, at least for hyperspectral imaging, these types of tensor decompositions. And I mean, right now we're still prototyping and blah, 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 but the launch date is uh, 2024. So in about two years, we're gonna launch from Cape Canaveral. And we're actually gonna do what's called piggyback ride um, on SpaceX launches. So SpaceX launches uh, has a mission every week. They launch satellites every week. So the, the whole point for us is to keep this cheap, right? So we're not gonna launch, launch a whole you know, rocket just for our satellite. We're gonna piggyback ride. Uh, whenever SpaceX sends, you know, I don't know, uh, food and supplies to the ISS, to the International Space Station, we literally require a 20 by 20 by 34 centimeter space that they store, they store our miniature satellite on. And then once they get, once they, they get into space before they reach the ISS, they just kind of let go of our satellite and it'll go in the orbit that we have planned for it. So, um, so Yeah, no, um, they, they do charge us for that. Um, but um, basically, I mean, basically most of the launches are, I mean, they are a major contractor for NASA and the Office of Naval Research. So their, their main clients are NASA and, and the ONR. This project, our project is sponsored by the ONR. So the ONR already has an agreement with them. But I mean, uh, technically we do have to pay. We have, we have to pay for the, the fee. The feedback, right? You know, but I mean, it's um, you know, it's reduced price because of the ONR uh, already has like a contract agreement with SpaceX. So I think, actually, I think the, the launch that we have is going to be on something that the ONR already paid for. So the ONR can choose, you know, can choose what else to include in the in the in the launch. You should include a space. So in, in the previous slide, the, the picture you showed was the compressed. Sorry, the, the one. Uh, is that that's a compressed image or is that the reconstructed image? This one here? That's compressed, right? This one here is compressed, yeah. So what does it look like? Or is the goal not to then reconstruct something like the initial picture? Or yes. What is, what is the reconstruction? Like? So the, it'll look like this, basically. The reconstruction will be like, like, like this. It'll be like a cube. Like a cube. So you have fish boxes and you have uh, a lot of weight, weight weights. So it, it'll be a, a data cube. And I mean, here, I mean, just for aesthetic purposes here, I just show it like a 2D image, right? right. And here, this, all those wavelengths kind of smooshed into a single measurement, basically, is what, is what we do. Yeah, but the, the final product is that cube, that data cube, which actually, by the way, instead of having like this, the whole point is we're going to have it like this. And you can still very easily say, you know, what do I have in this pixel and this wavelength? And this will extract it like, you know, in seconds. So it's very fast processing and storage of the In every step, it kind of and you run it fully and well reconstruct the image and then it will have to it with like the other And what is the information about like at the end of the because if you reconstruct are you getting like the exact uh, hyperspectral image? Yeah, and actually, uh, I'm, I'm really glad you asked that question because that was exactly what I was going to 
get to next. And by the way, the question was, how do you know you did a good job, right? How do you know the image you acquired is, is the quality you wanted, right? That you actually, that, that's basically the question, right? How do you ensure that you got a good image um, and not a noisy image, right? That's, yeah. It, yeah. So that's a perfect question. Um, and that's exactly what I was going to talk about next. So here, there is a lot of uh, open questions remaining. So um, how do you how do you program choose the patterns to uh, to project to uh, on the micro mirror device? And then how many patterns how many patterns do you need? How do you know when enough information is enough to get the quality that you want? So that's the intuition. It's the more information you gain, the better quality image you're going to get. At the same time, we want to reduce the amount of information we get because we want less data to transmit, and that. That's a very important question that we need to answer, which takes me perfectly to the next part, is answering these questions theoretically. How many, how many patterns are needed? So um, that's, where, um, that's where it's kind of nice that, uh, you know, that I'm a mathematician, so I can really sell these. To a sponsor, I can really sell the fact that I also can do theory to, to guarantee you that you have a high quality, high quality image if you program such and such patterns in such and such manner. So that's the next part is um, the theory of two way uh, compositions. Uh, two way to the compositions to exactly answer that question. Um, so, so hopefully this will answer your question. Um, okay. So now this is more of this is more of the theoretical part of, of my work. How am I doing on time? Um, it's already been an hour. Uh, are we going? Uh, uh, yeah, five five more minutes. Is, would it be enough? Okay, I'll do the I'll do the stream like you can. Okay, so um so this is uh I kept in very uh in very close touch with my collaborators at Sandia National Lab for my postdoc there, and now they're funding me to work on the so the main focus uh, of this grant, um, which actually it's more, it's a it's a half a mini per year, but this is the, the chunk that I get. Um so the main focus is um answering these theoretical questions so that practitioners can have a guarantee. That these methods work, and with you know, with this error, they will work if you do it in such and such manner. But there's other there's other um, aspects to this, like computational aspects. How can you solve these regression uh, uh, structure problems faster? And uh, finally, we do want to consider other applications. We already have the technology, but also this single photon count imaging, which is like lidar kind of holography, network communications, and technology. Any more applications? Um, so, okay, so I guess, um, what should I do? Yeah, I don't think I'll have enough time to go. Okay, so now, okay, so now to, to motivate, to motivate, and I mean, this is, it's different, but it's very, very related to what I just said, the hyperspectral imaging, uh, processing that data, it's, it, this is very similar, just like a kind of a different, uh, I would say more, more fun application. So motivation would be what's called the netflix the netflix problem so in one axis you have the users so this this row here corresponds to harry and in the, in the columns on this axis you have the movies so each movie is a different movie for example this one is the hobbit and this one is gravity so each user gives a rating to each movie this usually user really likes um lord of the rings the hobbit is lord of the rings right yeah okay we just don't rings, but he didn't like gravity so much, right? I don't know why they moved. But anyway, um, and and then this array will tell you the ratings, and Netflix can use that, um, you know, to better better providing these for their users. But they, they don't usually have this situation. They actually typically have this situation. It's um, you know, Harry has seen the, the Hobbit and gravity, but Harry has not seen the Hangover. So what? How should Netflix recommend the hangover? But based on other things that Harry and other users have seen, how should Netflix recommend um, the hangover to Harry? Like from, from one to five, let's say, right? So the goal is predict these unseen entries, which is called matrix completion, because you're, you're literally completing the, the matrix. Okay, so this is for two dimensions, but you can take it to three dimensions or higher dimensions. So, um, for example, you might do a better job if you organize before we have this users and movies. If we organize in this way, for example, maybe let's add another axis that captures the genres horror, romance, 
quantity, whatever. I mean, this seems like you could capture more information because you're kind of separating, you're kind of separating um, different movies in, in a way. So this seems like a, a more efficient way to process this data. So the benefit is reorganizing it appropriately, you can extract or exploit more information. The challenge is now we're back to sensors. We're back to sensors and we have these theoretical questions of how much is enough data? How much is enough data and which computational methods do we use? And will they work, you know? And th this is the work that, um, that Sandhya is giving me uh, money to, to work on, to work on, on the theory of this and applications. And um, I'm gonna skip these slides, but um, basically I work for them on a harder problem, um, but it's the same thing. It's, it's tensor completion. It's, you have unseen entries and you want to complete the tensor. And the main conclusion here is that, um, again, you know, again, surprise, surprise, the CPT composition, which I talked about the same time already. If you use the CPT decomposition, um, basically you can, uh, we can prove, we can prove how many, how many, um, how many observed entries you need to get a, a, a sufficiently good um, estimate. So basically, what it depends on, our result is that if the number of observed entries is of this order, so this means proportional to, so remember I, I is the dimension of, of, of each axis, R is the rank, how many factors you, uh, components you need, and then you have a logarithmic term in I. So we're able to tell you, if you have this many samples, uh, if, if the amount of information is proportional to this, you will get such um, error value, which is very close to that solution. So it's like, we can't be ready to tell them how many samples you need and how well you will do. So it's like, they're happy with that because now they can proceed um, you know, with more confidence in applying these things to different missions. In national security especially, they, they can't make mistakes, right? And there's a lot of work to do though. This is not like, can we improve this result? And the answer is yes. Um, uh, it's, this is an open problem, by the way. Like so far, uh, so far, no one has been able to answer this question for tensors. And this is what I'm telling you: for matrices, everything is very well known. For tensors, everything everything goes out the window. And the question is, and what I'm working on is, can you improve this? And the the conjecture is yes. And um, do we require this many observations? Anyways, that's that's what's coming up. What I'm going to work on later, and in particular. Uh, I'm applying it to um, uh, basically single photon count data. So this is a project with L3 Harris Technologies, which are in Melbourne, really close to NASA. And um, they have a separate hardware, and basically I have to, uh, uh, like, my job is to process their data in, in using CPT decomposition methods to get higher quality image in very adversarial conditions. So in particular, underwater imaging, um, where you have a lot of scattering. So instead of light being and so, light can be targeted directly to the sensor, as it would like in thin positions. Then, through the medium, you get a bunch of scattering artifacts, and you get a lot of noise, and you have to be able to do regression and processing of the data to get a better image. Okay, so I'm kind of just uh, skipping here, and blah, blah, blah. Okay, so that's it. Uh, thank you, and I just want to say that um, there's actually a lot of opportunities at Harvard Branch right now. Uh, I mean, summer just passed, but um, there's a lot of summer internships, both undergraduate and graduate level. There's a lot of opportunities for masters and PhD positions. I have funding for a couple of students, but it, um, that would be mainly projects involving a math and computer science. So um, you need to have some programming, but if you don't, you can come and learn. And, but also if, if your areas are, are, are not math and computer science, there's also a lot of projects that involve more mechanical and electrical engineering um, to set the hardware and, uh, and the mechanics that a whole big center. Um, and they also, also do a lot of marine biologists and people in ocean and atmospheric science. So um, if you're interested and you want to, you think of going to graduate school or summer internship, um, that's my email. Send me an email, we can, we can talk further. And um, yeah, thank you and uh, thanks to the organizers. And, Uh, are there any questions? Yes. Yeah. 
Yeah, uh, I have to admit, um, you know, um, I kind of messy when it comes to that, but I do, I do like, um, so for me, the key is set up regular meetings with uh, the people on each one. Like, um, even if you're going to talk to the same meeting, it gives you that regularity. So set, set up meetings, make a schedule, and then each day when we have a certain meeting, I think it's a whole day to that project. You know, like, and I, I mean, budget wise, you could have a proportion that you're supposed to be working on each project. Um, it's uh, a shift in the brain for compressing the information. Okay. Yeah, but um, it, it would just be like really, um, really make, make schedule. And for me, what works best is making uh, weekly meetings with students and with other people. It also really helps for me having students because I can, you know, I can feed them on their own and I can start working on other things. And then I meet with them and that counts as me working on a project and they make progress and then I can implement it. But, um, yeah, to be honest, it is tricky. Like, um, I'm doing okay right now. I have maybe like four or five projects. I want to keep it that way. But uh, yeah, I do also want professors that have like 15 projects and they just keep saying yes and yes and yes to those projects. So that's another important thing. Know your limits. Say no. It's okay to say no. Um, you know, I'm, I'm too well uh, stretched out. I can't work on anything else. Um, so yeah. More questions? How was that program? How was that program? For me, how was the program? Repeat the question. Huh? Repeat the question. Oh, yeah, sorry. The question was um, basically how did you learn our program? How was your programming experience in your career? And like I said, um, I learned to program in an internship. I, I had no programming experience before that. And basically, um, what I did is um, there, there used to be a space called the Euclid Project, and it was a bunch of like a uh, bunch of puzzles that you solve with your programming. So what I'll do is, as I will, you know, as I will set up the experiments and learn about what I was, what we had to do, and talk to my advisor in my internship, I will do these puzzles for fun. And I got actually got really close to the puzzles, and there's like 300 puzzles, and there's very few people have completed all of them. And actually, for for not having ever put them in my life, I actually solved like a really good chunk of them. In, my internship, but so basically for me, it felt fun helping those puzzles, and then also the project itself. Um, I just uh, I just learned there how to process images, how to extract certain pixels and that kind of stuff. And from there was a um, yeah, from there I don't really struggle with that. Basically, I just answered the question was um, you know, do puzzles, <laughs> you know, like for me, I rather for me, in my case, it was better to learn just get, getting my my hands dirty. Rather than going to a course and uh, you know get lecture, but I should have done that. I know I, I never took the programming course actually. So, what kind of programming language do you mainly use very often? Yeah, so um, I I mean done uh, Python and that that are on the two main things that I do. But some of the I use only Python, so everything Python. Um, and then and then MATLAB is just the easiest to work with students and all the applications that we have. I've done very little C++, but um, I have to say I'm not I'm not that fluent. So I have to say I, I do I do a lot of programming in English, but it's not my forte. But um, I'm well enough first that I can have all those problems. Good questions. Yes. Uh, what kind of sites do investors? Um, so, okay, actually, repeat, repeat the question. oh yeah, sorry, the question was, why did you decide to do a master's and not just, and not just a PhD? And actually, the reason was, um, I did get accepted, um, basically, I, I did get accepted to, to a PhD program at NYU, um, but it, it, it didn't come with a uh, guaranteed funding. So typically in the PhD, you, you, you get like a TA or, or RA type of uh, stipend, and that's how you pay for school and living and such cost. So I had the option, basically in the end, I ended up with the option of staying at UT Austin Masters or going to NYU. So um, yeah, living on NYU, living at New York with no money would have been possible. And they couldn't get into the stipend. And then UT Austin is, you know, UT Austin is top 10 math department in the world. So I decided to 
I just have to say, uh, uh, oh, and uh, you can also give me, me funding for my masters, by the way. So, masters, the decision came to masters at UT Austin with funding or PhD at NYU with more funding. And then Austin is so much cheaper to live. Now it isn't, it used to be back then. Now it really exploded in you know, the tech world. So, that was a decision I had to uh, make. And I, I couldn't really go to the but, uh, but yeah, um, that's it. why I chose that. Some other questions? Well, yes, um, what I thought about today is, but the, the psychology part that I talked in the beginning, so when I work with the uh, with sampling laboratory for imaging modeling, that one is, um, you know, uh, uh, that one is imaging on the ground as well. And that one, um, what we do is, you place a bunch of uh, sensors that, that basically, um, there's a whole different way to do it, but the most common way is um, you place sensors on the ocean um, surface, on water surface. And these, these measure of uh, basically pressure waves. And then you have a boat dragging the sensors, and they shoot uh, pressure waves into, into the ground. The ground shakes and it comes back to sensors and you record those, those pressure waves. And, and now that data, you process it and you get a three-dimensional volume, which tells you, you know, what's underneath the waves. So those, those are more, um, you know, it's a more like homographic. Um, One last question. We're running out of time. Are you guys able to predict that tsunami and hurricanes coming in due to the seismic or pressure waves in the air? The question was, are we able to produce um, a hurricanes and uh, no, predict? Predict, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, tsunamis and hurricanes. Sure. And um, you know, the, answer, the answer, as far as I know, um, tsunamis are pretty much, and earthquakes are pretty much unpredictable. 